Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. Every Monday since late April, a broad coalition of demonstrators have been organizing in Raleigh, North Carolina. They've been protesting the Republican majority's legislative agenda. They are calling the protest Moral Monday, and we're joined now by one of the organizers. Reverend Curtis Gatewood is a coalition coordinator for the North Carolina NAACP. From 2005 to 2011, Gatewood served as second vice president of the state's NAACP. He joins us now from Raleigh, where ongoing Moral Monday protests have turned out thousands. Thank you for joining us, Reverend. It's a pleasure to be here, Jessica. We bring greetings on behalf of the North Carolina NAACP, where Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II serves as our president. We're happy to be here. We're happy to have you on. So my first question is, based on what I've been reading in the mainstream media, it seems that they've portrayed this movement to be a bit unfocused. If you could just clear the record, what specifically are your demands? It's interesting. Uh, if anyone would consider our movement to be unfocused, it is very uh, puzzling to me because the movement is very focused. Uh, for the most part, we're focused, we're focused on justice. And justice uh, sometimes uh, will involve more than one issue. The issue basically started uh, around voting rights. It looks as if in North Carolina, we're having to deal with the 21st century version of interposition and nullification, uh, whereby in the 1960s, uh, you had a governor in Alabama who basically decided, regardless of what the Supreme Court um, said, uh, regardless of what the Congress may have passed, they have decided to use their state laws or their state position to nullify or go against uh, what the uh, U.S. Constitution or the U.S. Supreme Court had passed. And it seems like it's something similar going on here in North Carolina, for example. Uh, we, ha we uh, have a uh, legislature that, for, rather than coming in focusing on jobs, considering that the last quarter of our unemployment, uh, the last quarter of 2012, the unemployment rate was at 9.2%. Uh, now that's much higher than what was already considered to be a 7.8% unemployment rate for the nation. We already had 1.7 million people living in poverty. We already had of those uh, 600,000 children uh, living in poverty. Rather than coming in focusing on jobs, and focusing on ways to reduce the poverty rate, uh, it looks as if uh, this legislature, along now with the governor, they, they've instead uh, worked on things that would assassinate poverty. Uh, for example, uh, one of the first things that were passed by this legislature was to deny a half million people who were qualified to receive Medicaid benefits, I'm talking about medicine, and healthcare services, uh, rather than providing those services and accepting those services through the new uh, Healthcare Reform Act, which had already been passed uh, by the Congress and upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court, rather than accepting those funds and, uh, and helping to minimize uh, poverty here in North Carolina and suffering, this legislature and governor decided to deny a half million North Carolinians those funds. Uh, again, nullifying what had already been passed by the, U by the U.S. Congress and upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. Similarly, rather than focusing on jobs, this legislature uh, decided to come in and talk about voter ID, talking about voter fraud. When there, when there was no fraud to be found, uh, North Carolina had one of the best uh, voter laws in the state. Uh, we have signature signature attestation. Signature attestation requires that when you come in to vote, the only thing you have to do is state your address or come in and, and sign your name. When you sign your name, you're saying, if I am not Curtis Everett Gatewood, then I'm willing to uh, subject myself to a five-year felony for lying. That has worked in North Carolina. We didn't need voter ID. Um, we've been 237 years without voter ID. Voter ID, the laws, this voter ID law would come in conflict with the U.S. Um, 
the U.S. Constitution, uh, the U.S. Amendment to the 14th Amendment, to the 15th Amendment, to the 17th Amendment, and the 24th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we feel that it's unconstitutional, and the only, vote, the only voter fraud that we have now is the fraud that's coming through bills like the voter ID bill. That's the fraud. So that's another example. And, and this uh, legislature has been focusing on these types of uh, things rather than getting about the business of jobs, education, things that we know that would take people out of poverty and, and have people um, who are on the brink of poverty allowing them to succeed rather than doing those types of things. We've been tamping around now. We have about six voter suppression bills that have been drafted. We have Senate Bill 666, Senate Bill 666, and, and I think it, get, it has been given the right number, by the way. Senate Bill 666 will require any parent who has a child that goes off to college, if that child goes to vote uh, where that child goes to college, rather than coming back home, that child, that parent will be penalized $2,500, uh, not being able to claim that child as a, as, a, as a dependent. These are the types of laws that we're dealing with here down here. This is what we're dealing with in North Carolina. These are the things that are being proposed rather than coming in talking about jobs, jobs, jobs. We have similar legislation that's trying to undermine public education. Uh, we ha we've had a, a tax, the elimination of a tax earned earn income tax credit, which would cause 900,000 North Carolinians to be to taxes to go up while giving tax breaks to 23 millionaires here in North Carolina. So we, we, we understand that the agenda that, oh yeah, and, and then I haven't even talked about it rather than making sure we had jobs for those who were unemployed and lost their jobs at no fault of their own and were eligible to receive unemployment benefits now being denied those benefits, 170,000 people who would have been otherwise eligible to receive unemployment benefits. Unemployment, the bill also reduced the amount of money that would be received by those who qualify and will, and will eliminate 170,000 people off the unemployment rolls. These are the types of uh, draconian laws that we're having to uh, deal with. And I could go on. I don't think your show is long enough. <laughs> I understand. And, and you, you do have a long laundry list. Yes. So we know very well why we are, are here protesting. And we know very well why we need to, to reach now to a moral Monday, moral Tuesday, moral Wednesday. We need, we need to bring morality back to this state because when it, the, the morality of a state or a society can be best measured on how it treats its le the, those who are amongst the least, those who are most vulnerable. And the draconian law, the, the barbaric laws that are coming out of the legislature and, and now being poised to come across the desk of the governor. And the governor has pretty much has given us no indication that he's going to not sign many of these bills and the bills that have already been signed are, in fact, the unemployment money has been denied. The, the half million uh, people who've been denied Medicaid when the money was there. We already have the tax increase on 900,000 poor working people in North Carolina uh, while giving tax breaks to the 23, the, just only 23 millionaires got a tax break out of the deal while punishing the other 900,000 North Carolinians. Those bills are already passed. So I'm just saying, uh, we have we know full well why we are here. Let me just jump in for a second, Reverend, because um, there have been some comparisons made between your movement, the Moral Monday movement, as well as what happened in Wisconsin. And I just want to get a sense from you: um, are are some of those comparisons justified? And and what makes what makes your movement unique? They can be compared uh, through the fact that uh, people decided to stand up when. Uh, the, the people who had been elected were not doing the business of the people. Um, in Wisconsin, where you have people who are trying to uh, punish those people who belong to unions and trying to uh, dismantle 
uh, unions and, and rather than coming in providing jobs and making sure people had livable wages and making sure people had the best working conditions. Instead of doing that, you're trying to take away the leverage that the, the working people actually had uh, that should cause concern, that should cause protest, that should cause the good people coming together. So in that way, uh, it is similar. But uh, where we may be a little bit unique is here in North Carolina, through what we call HKONJ, where I serve as HKONJ Coalition Coordinator, it is the acronym for Historic Thousands on Jones Street, uh, where through the leadership of Reverend Barber, uh, when he was elected in 2005, uh, about a year later, he pulled together some of the best experts around the state, those who um, ex who were experts in uh, public policy, uh, who were experts in the law, who, was ex who were experts, experts in labor and, uh, and political science, and brought people together from around the state, put together coalitions uh, centered around a 14-point agenda, and pretty much the, the gender can be broken down into categories such as uh, equity in education uh, or economic sustainability or, or criminal justice. Um, in other words, equal protection under the law, health care for all and voting rights. Uh, around those uh, points, we brought people who, who came from across the state, whether they were heads of denominations and churches. Uh, we have like the AME Zion Church, the General Baptist State Convention. You have the labor organizations from around the state coming together. We have uh, black, white, Latino um, organizations who are part of this coalition, which consists of about 150 organizations. All together, we're talking about about 2 million people who, who are working in uh, as a coalition with the North Carolina State Conference of the NAACP. So we were here already dug in. We, we, we are already here knowing that this is not a moment for us. This is a movement that we, we were here working. We had already worked on uh, legislation that had passed through this coalition, such as uh, same day voting, um, the Racial Justice Act, which were passed in 2009, we were already based upon the work already here on the ground. So when this particular uh, regime came into office, we were already here working together as a community, black, white, Latino, uh, other people of goodwill, people who, who use the Bible for reasons other than to beat homosexuals over the head with the Bible, but actually using the Bible as a source of love, as a source of reaching out to people uh, who were amongst the least, as Jesus uh, asked that we do. And so we were already here using Bibles and using uh, the Constitution and using uh, history in a way that would uplift our community. So we were positioned. And so I think we have been underestimated by this uh, legislature and by this governor and we do not plan to go anywhere because we've always stood around the theme forward together and not one step back. As you said, you don't have any plans of going anywhere and there is a plan action um, every Monday. Is, is, is this indefinite? And um, we've already seen there have been numbers of arrests last week, it was in the 80s. Previously, um, 150 people arrested. Um, talk a little bit about your future plans. Yes. Yes, yeah, so far uh, we've had several arrests here, and that is that is an example of the dedication of people who are a part of this what we call love and justice movement, a forward together movement. We are working forward together, and so as a part of that, uh, the first on April 29th, uh, there were 17 of us arrested. Along with Reverend Barber, it was I was along with Reverend Barber myself and fifteen others, um, and that was that's basically what started the arrest. After we were arrested, and uh, and people were wondering why, of course, would we have been arrested since we were there in our house at the North Carolina Journal uh, Assembly at the legislature, which is of course our house there. In, in a nonviolent manner, uh, we were there um, demanding justice. Uh, we were holding up signs. We were singing songs. We were praying. Uh, many of the signs we held up had scriptures such as 
uh, war to those who make unjust laws, which comes out of Isaiah, uh, the 10th chapter, uh, other cha other uh, scriptures such as, as much as you done unto the least of these. And then we also had, uh, we held up our five uh, major areas of focus, such as economic sustainability, education, equality, criminal justice, um, health care for all, voting rights. And those were the types of signs we were holding. No, no one was threatening to do any violence or hurt anyone. And so uh, by the, the 17 of us being arrested on April 29th, uh, there were others who, who wanted to come back and, and be a part of this particular movement. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Reverend, and we'll certainly be following up on this story. You're certainly welcome. God bless you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.